So uh, I have a lot to share. Josh can always give you the scriptures. There's a, there's a lot of reference points. And so I'll do my best to kind of navigate and not take, have you here too long, but not shorten it to where you don't get exactly what the Lord would want you to get this morning. But Isaiah 21 is going to be the place where we're going to, we're going to, I like what my wife says, it's our launching point. That's where we're going to begin. Isaiah 21, 11, there's a prophet, Isaiah, that's talking about the burden. He's saying, I can't shake this off. I mean, you know, there's a burden that I have and it's, it's not something I can shake off. It didn't happen just last night. It's been a burden of my heart. And he says, the burden against Duma, he calls to me out of fear. And these are the words. It starts off with a question. It's a burden that begins with a question. And he says, watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? It would be, it would be as if someone came to you with a question. You know, what do you think about what's happening in America? Well, what do you think about what's happening in the nation of Israel? What do you think about what's happening with COVID? What do you think about what is going on in the earth right now? It would be if somebody asked you a question, you'd have to ponder. It's not, hey, where do you think we should have lunch? That's not really a burden. I mean, it can be if your stomach is growling, right? But I mean, overall, it's a burden. That, it's not very simple. It's not a quick fix. It's not a, hey, let's do this and then we can go on. It's more complex than that. And so he starts off with a question, but he never says, watchman, what are the morning, what are the night? He just says, watchman, what, is he, what are you pondering? What about the night? And he asked that two times in case he didn't get it. He says, watchman, what are the night? And he asked him again, what are the night? But his response isn't like you would think. He would have thought he would have said, well, the night is this. But he adds another word to that response, and he says, the watchman says that the morning comes, and also the night, if you will inquire, inquire, return, come back, the morning comes, and also the night. In other words, we can describe the night all around us. The night means that the world is getting darker, not literally, it's not like the sun is going out, it's not that, it's not that it's now cloudier, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying that the, that, that the length of time and our days are shortened in the sense that there's no longer 24 hours and it's just being shortened to 20 hours. That's not what he's saying. He's saying if you can focus on one or two things, you can focus on the darkness of all that we can say, man, you turn on the television, you go online, you watch your favorite app about the news and you can look and see what's going on in the world and it's just like darkness every day. And you can sit there and you can post it on your Facebook and you can say, this is how bad it is. And can you believe that this politician that I stood for, they made this decision or this politician over here that I didn't like, they made this decision. And, and, and you can be overwhelmed by all the darkness that's all around you. And unfortunately, it transfers into preaching as well. And you have some very meaning, they mean well, and they're, they're, they, they, they really believe, and, and then, but they're describing everything that's night. And so people leave congregations on a Sunday morning or whatever time you go to a service, and you leave a little bit hopeless instead of hopeful. And so then it becomes popular, then you're going to preach the end of the age and Jesus is going to come back maybe tomorrow and, because you're looking for a way of escape because there's such a burden and you're trying to figure it all out and you're pondering it in your soul. And what is the answer? The watchman responds, he said, I'm going to talk about the day. Yes, there is the night, but I'm going to talk about the day as well. I'm going to talk about the day of the Lord. I'm going to talk about what God is doing. That's what my wife got up and did. She said, we can talk about all of our weaknesses, but we can also say that his strength comes in and he empowers me. And it's like he infused me. He infuses me with this supernatural strength. That's what the walk of faith is all about. So he says, more the morning comes and also the night. So this morning I want to talk about in light of as I talk about the night, I want to talk about also the morning. In Matthew chapter 7, these are known as, it comes out of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, contained within Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 
is everything Jesus ever preached, every miracle, every, it's all contained in seed form. For those of you that are in agriculture, everything's contained within the seed. The, the life is in the seed and the destiny of that seed. And so you're not going to get a cantaloupe if you plant a tomato seed. It, it's all contained. It's, it's structure. It's nucleus. It's already within the seed. And so in Matthew chapter 5 and 6, everything is contained within there. And so he starts off with the Beatitudes, and it's more than what your, this should be, your attitudes. It's a whole lot more deeper than that. In fact, it really is a journey of your spiritual walk with God where you come and you have to humble yourself and blessed are the poor in spirit. And you have to humble yourself before God so you can enter in into the kingdom of God. And so it's just a couple of verses and then the rest becomes how you should live in the kingdom of God and how your life should be reflected. Well, when we get to Matthew chapter number seven, Jesus gives us a warning this isn't Pastor David that's prophesying, because I prophesy in parts, just a little bitty parts, like those beautiful 5,000-piece puzzles, and it's, I just have a little part, it's a little part of the whole. This isn't me prophesying. It's not your favorite prophet that's, that's prophesying. This is Jesus himself, and it's a prophecy that is coming, and it's, it, it, it's imminent, it's, it's, it's going to come is what he's saying. But he starts off by saying in verse number 13 of Matthew chapter 7, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. This is what he's saying. He's saying that the path of the righteous, the, the godly path, the holy path, the path of a, of a believer, the follower of Christ, the more you seek him, the more narrow that path becomes. But broad is the way, that, but it leads to destruction. In other words, it has to do with freedom. It has to do with boundaries. It's like the, the, the broad way is so, so, so broad. It was like, uh, uh, it, it's just so wide. There's so much freedom. And so he's saying it's narrow, the narrow path. It's about a complete surrender to the Lord. Verse number 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And then he says, let's talk about those that find it. He said, very few find that path. And then all of a sudden, it's almost like a shifting of gears. It's almost as if he's saying, well, hold on, we're, we we're driving a stick shift. We've been in first. Now we're going to shift it to third or fourth. It's, he's saying, beware. It's a danger. It's a warning sign. It's not a continuation of just something that's simple. He's saying, caution. Really more like red light. It's like when you're driving and you see the yellow and you know, you think, well, you know, right now it's kind of like yellowish red. This is a red light. It's stop. Beware. Well, what should I be concerned with? What should I be on guard against? What should I take heed? What, what is the warning? He says, beware of false prophets. Well, they're going to come to you just like as, as wolves, and you're going to be able to recognize them. That's not what he says. He says, they're gonna, you are going to be able to recognize them, but they're going to come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Hmm. A whole lot to ponder there. Beware of false prophets. Years and years and years ago, before I actually even met my wife, I just moved to Clovis. Hadn't been ordained in ministry, hadn't been licensed in ministry. Felt I had a call of ministry, didn't necessarily know what it was. But I had a dream. I had a dream of our city at that time. I'd only been here three or four months, if that, probably not even that, maybe two months. And in this dream, I'm walking down, it's like a city, it's because it had some somewhat high-rise uh, buildings. It was dark, it was at nighttime, just walking down the street. There was nobody on the street. I remember seeing some lights, no cars that were passing. All of a sudden I turned and there was, a, there was this 
there was it was a white wolf and it just like lunged at me and it got a hold like that it just bit my hand and then I just woke up I remember thinking Lord what in the world does that mean I believe that it was a segue it was a entry point because later I ended up really pondering that dream and my interpretation at that time was that of a religious spirit in that it was false teaching and there was some things that I was going to as a pastor later have to preach against stand against proclaim against because the hand represents the apostle and the prophet and the evangelist and the pastor and the teacher and it was going to try to even get a hold of me but it was white it wasn't a it wasn't a brown wolf it wasn't a black wolf it was a white wolf and so Jesus gives us a warning that this is what is going to happen. And what's interesting is he says, they will come to you. They come to you in sheep's clothing. It's not like you're looking for it. It comes to you. False prophets are going to come. But he says there is a measure. There is a way to measure this. Years ago, in fact, it was my oldest son, he was little, little, little. But he came in and he had a measuring tape. And he brings in the measuring tape and he goes like this. And he stands on top of the measuring tape and he said, how much do I weigh? Measure, it's, it does measure, but it doesn't measure your weight. Right concept, wrong measurement. In the body of Christ, hear the word of the Lord. In the body of Christ, we're not using the right measurement. This is how conferences normally look like. I'm probably not going to be invited to any of them. I don't have a big enough church. I don't have 2,000 members. Pastor David, you don't fit the category. And so typically in our conferences, it's always about how big and how many and how many churches and how many people you have under you. And he, so we measure that. That's the way we measure. It's the wrong measurement. So as a result, false prophets, false teachers, they're in our midst. If they're not coming. They're already here. Nobody asks the question, wouldn't it be wonderful on those beautiful flyers that we, that we, we spend so much money, we even have people on staff that that's what they do. They do all the designs, they do all the marketing, but we're missing the mark. I have no problem with excellence. I have no problem with people being involved and engaged. That's not what I'm saying. Don't mishear me. What I am saying so you can hear clearly is this. You better know that you know. Ask some personal questions. Ask them about their wife. Ask them about their husband. Ask them about their children. Do they have a relationship with their kids? Let's put that on the flyer. Let's talk about their faithfulness. Let's talk about how they manage and how they steward the house of God. Let's talk about personal finances and can they be trusted with resources? How are things being used for the ministry? On my way today, I just needed some time to pray and and so I, I left, but I was listening to a, this, this podcast and it was about the voice of the martyrs and it stirred my heart. There was a guy that he and his wife were, were missionaries in Iran, of all places. And so this is with the Ayatollah Khomeini and all the, the things that happened in 1979 under Carter and all the, the hostages and everything that was leading up to that. They, they, were, they were missionaries at that time. Well, they were asked to leave the country and God did some new supernatural things, how he opened the door for them to be able to leave. But that said, he said, we had $50,000 in our account as a church. He said, I didn't want to leave it in that account because I didn't want it to fall into the wrong hands. I didn't want uh, these radical Muslims to have it. And so he said, I went that day and I withdrew. He had seven days, really six days at this point to leave. So he went and withdrew it all, $50,000. And I thought, wow, you know, what, to entrust, he has, that's a, that's a significant amount. That's in 1979. You're talking probably 75, maybe $100,000 worth now. What did he do? Did he put it in his own bank account? Did he say, hey, it's a perfect time. We've always needed a, a new car. Let's go get our cars now. Did, you know what he did? He prayed and the Lord spoke to him. He says, go. And he started going to all these various ministries across Iran that he knew. And he just started giving them money. There were, there were the locals that had uh, churches. And so he started, he gave it all away. He kept $1,000, but kept $49,000 away. 
And then wouldn't you know it, it, it sustained those churches. It sustained the work of God for the next couple of years because not much after that it was passed in America that they could not funnel money that direction. And trusted men, that's who I want to have at a conference. That's who I want to hear. I want to hear somebody that, that you can entrust with that. We're so deceived. You listen to me. And it's a righteous anger because you listen to me. We are deceived and we're wondering why we are deceived because we have the wrong measurement. Uh, we're, we're looking how, how, how wonderful and how everything that's external. But he said inwardly, inwardly, look within. There are ravenous wolves. The word ravenous has the word raven in it. And with every wolf, you're always going to find a raven. And so the raven comes and takes all the leftovers, whatever that wolf leaves behind. It comes and it takes it all. It's a greed. It's a, it, it, it comes in. It's like the, the, it's going to scavenge everything that, it, that was left behind. Jesus says, beware. That's what's coming. In Matthew chapter 24, and talking in the, about the end of the age, Jesus says, Jesus went out in verse number one and he departed from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple and Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly I say to you that not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, I tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed, warning, beware, that no one deceives you. For many, not some, not a few, many will come in my name, as if they're representing me, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you think, oh, pa Pastor David, that's easy. What are you saying there, Jesus? I'm not going to follow that. But it's much just, it's not just that. That's easy, right? They got somebody to say, they long beard, he's got a, you know, this clothing. So he's going around saying, they're Jesus, we know that. They're going to be deceived with that. But he says, many will be deceived. Because Christ means the anointed one. Many will come and say, oh, look, they're anointed. They, they, they have the power of God. They have the presence of God. Uh, they're coming as the Christ, as the anointed one. They have an incredible anointing. I saw it pastoring over them, and these incredible things were happening. He says, take heed that no one deceives you. Verse number six, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must, must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and then there's going to be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. He says, but all this is just the beginning. It's the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, and they will betray one another and will hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached. And all the world is a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. It's a whole lot there, and I certainly don't have time to share those this morning. So what is the wolf that has come in through the centuries? This has been 2,000 years since Christ prophesied. Acts chapter 20, this is the Apostle Paul. He's got about four, five, six years to live at this point. He knows the end of his life is coming, not because he has a terminal disease. But he has a relationship with God. He knows that he's no longer going to see these brothers and sisters in this part of the earth. He's reflecting. He's saying, hey, this is what you need to know. In verse 30 or verse 28, out of the NIV, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he says, keep, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come and they're going to come in among you. 
and they're not going to spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Ravenous wolves, ferocious wolves are coming. Men that are from your own number that are going to arise are going to distort the truth. So I used to think that a wolf was going to come from the outside. I did. Persecution in the future, maybe not our generation, maybe not even my children, but maybe my grandchildren. Maybe they were going to experience what a lot of the world experiences, and maybe the world was going to change in a way where to be a Christian wasn't going to be as popular as it is right now, because really it costs us very little. And you know, I'm not concerned with somebody arresting me because I'm preaching or have a Bible in my hand. I'm not concerned because I'm a Christian and I might wear a Christian t-shirt or I express my faith however I do. And so I used to think that the wolf was somewhere on the outside, just waiting. Maybe it was going to be some type of wolf that was going to come in the form of a government, government leader, and they were going to ravage the church, and they were going to harass the church, and they were ferocious wolves that were coming. But Jesus lets us know, and then the apostle lets us know. He says, no, they're going to come from within you. Just somewhere in your mix, there's going to be the people that talk they, 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 they're incredible teachers, but somewhere they got off track. Somewhere they, they, there was a character issue. They, got, they, 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 they fell off. They, they got way off. They, they got so much into themselves. They got prideful. They, they, they were lustful. They were greedy. Something took them off course. Something took them off guard. Something just took them off the course. But they were going to be right in your midst, in our churches, in the churches of America, in the churches of the nations, they were going to be within our midst. Beware. Danger. Be on high alert. So he says false prophets are coming. And then he says they're going to distort the truth. They're going to twist the truth. And then in 2 Peter chapter number 1, it says, but there were also false prophets among the people. It's already happening in their generation. And then he says, not only are there going to be false prophets, he says, just as there will be false teachers among you. So this morning, I just want to talk about one Probably by the time it's said and done, I don't know. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. But there's about 12 that I would like to cover. Don't go into shock. Come back. <laughs> but I want to talk about this word. It's called cessationism. Okay, now that's like, what in the world is that, right? All that means is just think about something means to cease, to stop. And that's, that's good enough. Cessationism. It means to cease, to stop, the act of discontinuing. Cessationism is the teaching that the supernatural power of God, signs, wonders, miracles, ceased with the early church. That's what cessationism is. And I could call out the various denominations. I'm just telling you that this is what it's taught, whether it is whatever denomination. But what it's taught is, if you, if you talk to them about the Bible, this is what they'll say. Did Jesus walk on water? Yes, he walked on water. Did Jesus heal blind Bartimaeus? Yes, he did. Was he asleep in the midst of the storm and they woke him up and he said, peace be still. And all of a sudden, the, the, everything just ceased and a calm came. And they said, who can this be that even the winds and the waves obey him? Do they believe the biblical narrative? Yes, they do. Do they believe that Jesus, when there was 5,000 men 
plus with the women and the children, maybe 15 to 20,000 people that they come and they bring, there was a little boy that had his little sack lunch and he had loaves and fish and he put it into Jesus' hands and, and he takes it and he blesses it and he breaks it and he gives it to the disciples to give to the people and everybody was satisfied and everybody got to eat that day, they would say, yes, I believe the biblical story. Do you believe that he did another miracle of feeding 4,000 and there was 12 baskets left over of fragments? And yes, I believe. Do they believe that Jesus healed the blind, healed the sick? They called all those with evil spirits and various kinds of sicknesses and he healed them all. Yes, Pastor David, I believe. Do they believe that Jesus said that the gospel message will go to the ends of the earth and then the end will come? Yes. Do they believe in Matthew chapter 24, what I just read, that pestilences are coming, famines are coming, earthquakes are coming? Yes, Pastor David, I believe. Do they believe that the, the baton was passed to what we call the early church in the book of Acts and they say, Oh, yes, Acts chapter 1, they, they, they called for a meeting because Judas had betrayed uh, Jesus. And so uh, he, he now has taken his own life and he has to be replaced. And so they were a growing church, growing in their understanding. This is what they knew. Hey, it's like us picking straws and we're going to pick and see which one is the longest one and you're the one that wins. And so there's two men. I said, well, let's look at, 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 at Matthias, and I think the other man's name is something close to Barnabas. Let's, let's pick and see. Oh, if the lot falls on Matthias, so he's the next apostle. Do they believe the biblical story? Yes, Pastor David, I believe. Do they believe that Jesus told them that he is going to send the promise of the Father in Luke chapter 24 and then in Acts chapter 1 before he's ascended, he said, go, go to what they called an upper room and you have about a 10-day window and, and because Jesus has been on the earth for 40 days and now 50 days after Passover, we're right at Pentecost, you got about a 10-day window. And you're going to go and I want you to pray and just seek God. And do they believe that all the people that were there were about 120 people and they were praying? They said, yeah, Pastor David, I believe that. Do they believe that the supernatural wind of God's spirit began to blow on that, that morning? And they're praying and they're, they're seeking God, 120 people, men and women, just seeking God. And all of a sudden they begin to hear a wind. And this wind begins to rush into this room and then their eyes are open. And it's like, oh my goodness, it's something supernatural. It's like they almost look like tongues that are on fire that are falling on the people. And they're speaking in various languages. And, and then they walk out and there's hundreds of people that are in Jerusalem at that time time to celebrate Pentecost and these people are from different nations and these people hear them speaking and glorifying and praising God in their own tongues in their own language and Peter stands up and he says this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel that in the last days I would pour out my spirit upon all flesh your sons and your daughters will prophesy and he's saying that this is what God is doing and 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 Thousands of people <coughs> come to know Christ with that one preaching. You say, Pastor David, I believe that. That's what they would tell me. My Methodist friends would say that. My Baptist friends, my Church of Christ friends, my Church of God, they would say, yeah, I believe that. That's the biblical story. That's the biblical narrative. They would take the pages of the book of Acts and they would say, oh yeah, when Peter and John are on their way to pray, and it was the hour of prayer, and they're on their way to prayer, and then they pass a man, and he's there, and he's lame. He's been, he couldn't, can't walk. It hasn't been a year. It hasn't been 10. It's been 40 years. He's 40 years old. It's been all his life, and all they do is they carry him. They set him right there as a beggar just to ask for alms, asking for money to help him. That day they pass him, they're coming up the steps of the Solomon's portico, Solomon's, the, the, the outside of the entryway to the temple. And that day he's asking for alms and they look at him and they said, look at us, silver and gold, we don't have that. But what we do have 
in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he said, they took him by the hand. And then he also comes up and he, everything's just kind of straight and the ankle bones, everything comes together and he begins to rejoice and he's leaping and he's praising God and he goes to the temple and they see him rejoicing. So this is the same one that was 40 years, it's been like this and, and God did something supernatural and hundreds of more people came to know Christ. And they said, yeah, Pastor David, I believe that. And then if you say that, they're having a prayer meeting in the next chapter, and they're saying, Lord, behold, their threatenings are being thrown into prison because a miracle was worked in Jesus' name. And they said, there's only one thing. You can go free. There's just one thing. You can no longer speak and preach in his name. They said, no. Hey, we're going to obey God. It's better to obey God than men. So they're having a prayer meeting, and they're saying, Lord, behold, their threatenings. Look, they're, we're starting to feel persecution. The Holy Spirit comes. The whole place is shaken. They're filled again with the Holy Spirit. And I said, Pastor David, yeah, I believe that's in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 5, I, I see that. I, I believe. And if you say something incredible happened, people began to be generous, and they're selling their property, and they're, 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 they're saying, hey, I got $30,000 from this property. Here you go. I just want to give it. Let's, let's care for the needs of those around us. God has blessed us so much. And we have an abundance. We want to bless the widows. We want to bless the poor. We want to bless the orphans. We want to bless people that need because God has blessed us. So it's this incredible amount of giving. And they're, they're coming together and they're rejoicing from house to house. And they just can't get enough of God. And they're coming together and say, Pastor David, do I believe that? Yes, I believe the story. And if they say something was like a pause, like a, something that doesn't even fit the story, something that doesn't fit, it's like out of place, and that is Ananias and Sapphira, because we're in the time of grace, Pastor David, and it doesn't mesh well with our grace and our love message of God, and doesn't seem to fit the mold, but the story is there nonetheless in the book of Acts, and they had conceived within their own heart to deceive the Holy Spirit and to lie to the Holy Spirit because they went and sold property and they said, hey, we're going to bring it to the church. And let's just say they said, wait, well, hey, we sold it for, for 20000 but in reality they sold it for 50000 We don't know the amount, but they, they lied nonetheless. And then so Ananias is the first one at this service that they're happen, having and he comes and he straight out lies and he says, yeah, I want to give this. Obviously, there's pride in his heart. He wants to try to show that he's somebody that he really isn't, that there's some issues really in his character. He, he could have been honest and said, hey, yeah, I'm just giving half of it. That wasn't required of them. It wasn't like you had to. It was nothing like that. But he was misrepresenting the people of God. He was misrepresenting the Holy Spirit. And so they said, well, it was in your own power, in your own hand. It was yours to do with whatever you wanted to do, but you lied to the Holy Spirit. And there was a boldness that came upon Peter. And next thing you know, it, Ananias, the life is sucked out of him, and he dies, and then they pick him up, and they carry him out. So his wife, which that happens where your wife is three hours late, and so his wife is three hours late. No, I thought this was a funny, I saw this little meme. It was hilarious. So it has like this, this vine. It's in England, but a vine is growing and it's in this old car and it's, it's all covered. And then it's saying that the man was in there, that he, this is a joke, he wasn't literally in there, but that he died in that car waiting on his wife because she was running by him. So three hours later, Sapphira, his wife, shows up. That's what the Bible tells us. They'd already talked about it. They conceived. She could have been honest and said, oh, no, we, this is, he told you that? No, this is how much we really got for it. But she lied as well, and she dies. So if you would ask current day college professors that teach at incredible colleges that are much, know a whole lot more than I do, do you believe the story? Yes, I believe the story. I believe it. It's in the Bible. You tell them about the Apostle Paul when he was Saul and he was having all these threats against the church. And Stephen is, stands up and he's one of the seven that is God uses to help. And he's a godly man. He's full of the Holy Spirit. And yet he preaches a message. and The religious leaders get so angry at him. They end up taking him outside and they 
take rocks and then they stone him to death. I said, oh, Pastor David, I, I believe this. Or yeah, I remember Jesus was standing because he's usually seated at the right hand of God. But he was standing at that moment. I believe the story. And then if they tell them about the Apostle Paul when he's Saul and he's out doing his own things and all of a sudden he's on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus and he's got quite a journey to get there and he's walking and there's other men with him and he's persecuting the church and all of a sudden this bright light shines and it's Jesus himself and he says to him, Paul, you're fighting against me. You're kicking against the codes. That instrument that they would use, it was real sharp to, to, to prod the, the oxen. He's saying, you're hurting yourself. And then blindness comes upon him, and then he has a vision that a man named Ananias is going to come, and he's going to lay hands on his eyes, and he's going to see, and God moves in Ananias, and Ananias comes to him, and he, he lays hands on him, and he says to him, Brother Saul, the Lord came to me, and he said to come lay hands on you, and he gets, he, he feels the power of God, he gets saved, he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, Pastor David, do you believe the story? Yeah. Pastor David, yeah, of course, I believe the story. I believe. You could go from the pages and pages of the Bible until you get to Acts 28, and the Isle of, island of, of Malta, and they're going to be shipwrecked, and, and then Paul is a worker. I like Paul because he's always working. He's a tent maker. He's a hard worker. He doesn't want everybody to give him thousands of dollars. He, he says, you know, I'm a single man. He probably was a widow. He says, I, I, I'll provide for myself. And so he's a hard worker. So he's out there. and It's probably cold on this island. He goes and let me do my share, and he's going to get firewood because I have a fire going. And so he goes and he collects his wood and he's bringing it back. And, and they're kindling the fire, and there he throws it into the fire only for a snake, a serpent, to jump out and just bite him on the hand. And it says he shook it off into the, to the fire, and nothing happens to him. This is a venomous, poisonous snake. The locals knew that. They're amazed. They think, man, is he a god? And they. But God did something incredible and he brought incredible healing to this island and the gospel came. If I said, do you believe the story? Of course, Pastor David, I believe the story. But what happened then along the way? Because Pastor David, I believe it was for that day, but it's not for this day. I believe it was for the early church, but it's not for today. I believe it's for the apostles, but not for today. I believe there was prophets in their day. I believe in Agabus, that Agabus took the belt of, of Paul, and he says, whoever is the owner of this belt, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go bound to Jerusalem. They would have believed the story, but they don't believe in the prophets today. They don't believe in apostles today. All they've left us with is pastors and teachers and evangelists, and that's about it, and pretty much is reserved to men, and that's about it. And it's to the elite, and it's those that have an education, and you have to, you have to go, and you have to learn the Greek, and you have to learn the Hebrew, and that finally qualifies you. But they deny the power of God. It's called cessationism. It's to cease. It's to stop. And it crept into the church. And it crept in a long time before your father and mother ever knew each other, before you ever came into existence. It happened long before my great-grandparents. It happened long before America was ever established. We're talking about it's been close to 1,000 or 2,000 years. Because it happened not, ab not much after Peter tells us false prophets are already in our midst. False teachers are coming. 20, 30, 40 years into the early church, they're already starting to show up. And then the church went through what was called the Dark Ages. Watchmen, what of the night? Watchmen, what are the, the morning's coming, but also the night. The Dark Ages brought about darkness, not literal darkness, but spiritual darkness the word of God away from the people of God. They can't believe the story if they don't have the story in their hands. But men and women that were bold that said, we're going to make a change. We're going to put the gospel, we're going to put the word of God in the hands of everyday people. Started what was called the Reformation. And the Reformation began to reform things and began to change things and began to call out what was godly and what was ungodly and what was a godly priesthood and what was an ungodly priesthood. So where are we at today? 
in our time period. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, and then we'll also cover Acts chapter 3. We'll start off with Acts chapter 3, Josh, and then we'll go to Hebrews chapter 6. Acts chapter 3 and verse number 19. It says, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he, that's capitalized, that God the Father may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. This is what he's saying. He's saying God's going to restore all things. Right now we're in the until, right? We're, we're until. It's, it's until, until we all come to the unity of the, effect of the faith, until. These words until. This is right now Jesus is being held back in heaven, right? He's going to come. It's going to happen. Every eye will see him on that day. Even those that pierced him, he, they will see him on that day. He is coming. There is a literal return of the coming of the Lord. We call it the second coming. He is going to come. We said there's an until moment. And the until is there's going to be a restoration of all things. There's going to be a restoration of the very thing that men tried to stop and said, they've ceased. They stopped with all the apostles. The last apostle, when they died, it was over with. It was so that they could preach the God. This is their belief. It's so that they could preach the gospel quicker and so that they could get the message out quicker. And so they were preaching it in their, the tongues were in their own languages and they came to know Christ. And so it was to help speed it up. I don't know about you with that same reasoning and we need that today to help speed it up, to help, to help propagate it, to help empower us. Amen. But Jesus said it's coming. There's going to be a restoration of all things. Right now he's being held back. Heaven's holding them back until the restoration of all things. Hebrews chapter 6 lets us know what he's restoring. Hebrews 6 1 says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection or maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. What do you mean, Pastor David? This is, it's in that order. This is how God is restoring that order. Remember, the Reformation, that was 500 years ago. We just celebrated it not too many years ago. We had a big celebration. We joined the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians. And so we did a 500-year anniversary. When Martin Luther goes and he says, there's got to be a change, and he he writes the thesis of all the various things of this is what he had against at that time what was a Catholic church. And he begins to say these are the things that are not right. But one of them was justi justification by faith. In other words, the only way you get saved is by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So that's when we began to see a restoration of all things. It's the first one on the list here. He says these elementary principles of Christ, that's salvation, just the basics and now we're going to grow up. That's what perfection is. We're going, to, we're going to mature in Christ. So the first one is that. And then the foundation of repentance by the blood of Christ. Then there's a restoration of faith. We've seen that with people like um, uh, Brother Hagen. You know, the Lord spoke to him. He said, teach my people faith. And so that was a long time ago and so God in the 50s and the 40s and so God was doing that and he was restoring faith to the people of God and then we see the next one was the doctrine of baptism it doesn't say ism it says baptisms it's a plural it's more than one so one is water baptism that God has restored thank you the very thing that we just take for granted they didn't do six or seven hundred years ago because God is restoring all things. But the other baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. The wolf came in, in our midst, and began to say, that's not of God, that's a long time ago. That was for them, that's not for you. That, 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 was, that was for that generation. But he's gonna restore all things. 
I believe the rest of those things are going to happen in the future. We're seeing the laying on of hands, which is the supernatural power of God to heal. And then I do believe literally people will come back to life like Tabitha did in the book of Acts and eternal judgment. So God is restoring, I believe, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Right now there's 500 million Pentecostals, people that are filled with the Holy Spirit or profess to be filled with the Holy Spirit throughout the world. There's over 7 billion people, about 500 million are in that category that they speak in other tongues. They've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. They were saved and then they, 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 they now have been filled with the Holy Spirit. See, the very thing that they said ceased is the very thing you and I need Amen. for our own life. That's what, that's what empowers me to preach. That's what empowers me to go, know God's word. That's where revelation comes. That's what helps me when I don't know how to pray. I begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. That's where I have an encounter with God. That's where I, I'm, I'm speaking mysteries to God that I don't even know what I'm saying, but I'm just speaking in another language. It's, it's, it's my prayer language. It's my, my time with the Lord. It's how he empowers me to be a witness. But cessationism said... It's over. But Jesus told us in Luke 24, 49, he says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. And you will be endued, Luke 24, 49, and you will be endued with power from on high. We need the power of God restored. Because of time and my sons are doing kids' church, we'll say uh, Mark chapter 16 and verse number 15. Mark 16, 15, the Bible says, And Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all the creation. To all creation, the one who has believed and has been baptized will be saved. But the one who has not believed will be condemned. So when I was growing, I grew up in a Baptist church. Good people love the Lord. They're in heaven incredible Bible teachers helped me grow in my faith, taught me all the books in the Bible. By the time I'm in second and third grade, know the books of the Bible, know a lot of Bible verses because, hey, who doesn't want a donut for saying a Bible verse? You know, hey, so, you know, I, I would learn all the, the, the Bible verses and, yeah, whatever it takes. And so, you know, man, a donut for, yeah, John 3.16 here. Let me give it to you. And so, and, you know, a bus comes and picks us up. We don't even have to worry about that. And we're at church. And they have puppets. That's cool. That's those cool little puppets. I wonder who's behind there. And they're pretty cool. And they're interacting with us. And, and we're singing the songs. And we're clapping. And it's just a great time. And it's wonderful. And did I believe in the gospel? Go to the ends of the earth. Of course. I heard it over and over and over again. But they never <laughs> continued reading in the book of Mark, that was it. Uh, I mean, that, that was it, go preach to all creation. They never read it to me. And I'm 18 years of age, I'm an exchange student in France. I'm there, I come back, this Baptist church that I'm a part of doesn't seem like the same Baptist church I grew up in. And I'm thinking, man, people are, they're the same people, but different. And so I remember I was not here, I was sitting like in the second row of this church. I was crying and crying. I never really had those kinds of tears in church. I was crying. I'm thinking, what in the world? But it's just the presence of God. I didn't know back then. It was the presence of God. I remember just wiping tears, just tears and tears and tears. And, and my parents were going to Disneyland. And they said, hey, we're going to go to Disneyland. We're taking the grandkids. We're going to be gone for, I don't know, two weeks or so. And I said, you know what? I I've been gone for a year. I want to see some of my friends. It's just like almost August by this point. School, college is going to start up. I said, you guys go. I want to stay so I can see some of my friends. I said, all right, that's, that's fine. So, man, if I could do it all over again, I would have gone to Disneyland. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I, um, so I go. But my dad said, there's only one thing I'm going to ask you to do. Why don't you go to this prayer meeting on Monday night? So the, that weekend we were talking on Monday night. I said, okay, I'll go. And I did. I went. I'm 19 years old by this point. So I go, and it's a little small house, but about 40 people. I and mean, we're packed in there. We had like, you know, all the French around in the middle. And, 
And so they asked if they could pray for me, and I said, yeah, that's fine. So I just get on my knees, you know, they, like right, and they just huddled around me. And they're just praying, Lord, fill them with the Holy Spirit. Let your power come upon them. They just feel all these hands laid on me, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm not ready. I, I'm not ready for that. I, I don't even know what that is yet. I'm not ready for that yet. And so I, I, I told them thank you for the prayers. And so I went on a journey, my own, me. I was a 19-year-old kid, but I said, I'm going to do it myself. So I began to look through the Bible. That was the first time I ever read that in what I'm about to read here. In fact, I'll just read it now. So Mark chapter 15, or Mark chapter 16, we finish with verse 16. But 17 says, these signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. If they drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. I never read any of that. And I just, I remember starting off with that. Started off with the book of Acts. Started going through the pages of the book of Acts. I wish I should have brought my Bible that I had at that time. But the, I started just looking through the, the, the pages of the book of Acts. And then I saw that in Acts chapter 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit again. And then in Acts chapter 6, the Bible says Stephen was filled. And then eight years later in the book of Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, with the laying on of hands. And I saw that the Apostle Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then I saw that in Acts chapter 10, this is 10 years after Pentecost, that Peter goes to Cornelius' home, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and then Apollos, and he doesn't know. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I never saw this. Never in my life. It took me about three months. And I remember I was by myself, and I got on my knees, and I lifted my hands, and I said, Lord, I said, well, I said, Father. I said, Father, I want everything you have for me. And I just lifted my hands like that, and that was the day he came, and he filled me with the Holy Spirit, and my life has never been the same since. Amen. Amen. Because the wolf came in, and the false teachers came, and they tried to take it away from us the very power that we needed to be a witness, the very power that we needed to lay hands on the sick, the very power that we needed to bring deliverance to people from all types of addictions. He came and he robbed us. He's like, he took it away. There's a restoration of all things. 1906, 1907, Azusa Street. From that, the Church of God in Christ came. The Assemblies of God came about. The Church of God came. God began to do incredible things. It was an explosion of the Holy Spirit. And in 100 years, a little over 100 years, more people have been filled with the Holy Spirit than those other centuries combined. So the Holy Spirit is just exploding in the ends of the earth. We're seeing it in Brazil. You're seeing it in, in, in Asia. And the, the Holy Spirit is just exploding because that's where the power of God is. This morning, I want to pray for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me just read a passage here. Uh, Josh, if you could put it up for me, I, I'd, I'd have to look through all these pages here, but it's Acts 1.8. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. I guess my Bible's here. Acts 1.8. If you can stand as I read this. Acts 1.8 says, but you shall receive power. It doesn't say you might. It doesn't say it depends on how things are going. It doesn't say, well, the early church is going to receive the power. It doesn't say, well, yeah, the people of the Reformation are going to receive the power. It says you. You shall receive power. Well, when is it going to happen? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Amen. And as a result, this is going to be the result of that. You will be a witness to me. And where? Jerusalem. We think, okay, well, we saw that in Jerusalem. Then he says, but I'm going to expand that influence. It's going to go to all of Judea. And then it's going to expand to Samaria. 
And in case you're wondering what the Holy Spirit's going to do, it's going to happen in the ends of the earth until the restoration of all things. This morning, I'll just have you come here to the front, and I just, and Pastor Richard and our elders, if you guys can help me, we're going to pray. And if you want the power of God, the Holy Spirit, if you've given your life to Christ, and you don't speak in other tongues, if you've never felt or never been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and this morning I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. We're not going to do anything other than just pray for you. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be worried. He's the same Holy Spirit that when you gave your life to Christ, that touched your heart. It's the same Holy Spirit that comes upon you. The second ones I want to pray for is are these. That's in Acts chapter 4. In verse number 31, Acts 4.31, these are the same individuals. It's Peter and John and those that had been on the day of Pentecost that had been filled with the Holy Spirit. But look at what Acts 4.31 says. It says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. What does that say to me? Praise God for what happened to me in 1989. That was wonderful. But I need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. We need to be continually filled. You say, well, Pastor, you spoke in tongues 15 years ago. That's wonderful. We celebrate that. Where are you at right now? You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. Today. And if you want to come here, that's fine. If where you're at is, is fine. We're just going to ask the Lord to do what only He can do. So on the receiving of the Holy Spirit, first you have to ask. Just ask Him to come and fill you. And then you have to receive. It's like receiving Jesus in your heart. And then you have to, whatever comes, you have to speak it out of your mouth. It's like me, I came with a whole bunch of notes, right? words what if I would come in here and say well it's waiting for God to open up my mouth so that I can I have to exercise my faith so when the Holy Spirit comes upon you just by faith just begin to release that river and you just begin to speak you just let him take over and just begin to speak those mysteries to God in a heavenly language sometimes he uses languages from this earth I don't want to get caught up in all of that. Just let the Holy Spirit fill you. Thank you, Lord. Just lift your hands. And if you're watching this morning right where you're at in your home, at your home there, just lift your hands. Maybe you want to get on your knees. But just lift your hands. Everyone, just lift your hands. Father, first of all, we come to give you thanks. We give you thanks, God, that you are restoring all things, God. And the very thing that Satan tried to come and steal and rob from the church, which was the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, God. Like Martin Luther, we take it and we nail it to the doors of the church and we say he's going to restore all things. He is restoring being filled with the Holy Spirit because we need the power of God to be a witness to the earth because America needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. Yes. And so, Father, I pray and I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and fill people with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Maybe it's been a long time, God, for some. But, Lord, I pray that you come and you fill people with the Holy Spirit. Let's begin to fill them with your Holy Spirit, Lord. It's the promise of the Father. You said you would endure us with power from on high, God. And so, Holy Spirit, let's pray that you move upon people like you did in the book of Acts, God. Like you did in the upper room, Lord. Like you did when they gathered together and they were being threatened, Lord, with imprisonment. You came and you shook the place and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, God. 
Lord, just like you did with the Apostle Paul, Lord, you came. Just fill us with your Holy Spirit, God. Fill us, God, because we need you. We have need of you, Lord. Our generation needs you, Lord. We need you, God. We need the power of God. Lord, come. Just fill us. Just fill us with your Holy Spirit, God. Just begin to just speak. Speak in the, in the Holy Spirit, in the language of the Holy Spirit. That's right where you're at. Just let him add some words to your vocabulary this morning. Come on now. The same way they need faith to receive the Holy Spirit for the first time and being filled, so do we, so that our vocabulary can be expanded, so that he can give us the language from heaven, just by faith, just by faith, just by faith. The Bible says, build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, just by faith, just by faith. Just let it flow out of you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Just come with the wave of your glory this morning, God. Just come with the wave of your glory, God. Just come with the wave of your glory, Lord. Just come with the wave of your glory. Oh, the Lord is removing the shame because there's some of you, you're struggling with shame and that's, been a, that's, that's a hindrance for you. You're saying, my life hasn't been right. Well, he's going to give you the power to live right. But you need the power of the Holy Spirit in order to do that. And so that's, the Lord is coming to remove that shame from you. The Lord is coming to remove that shame. You've already asked the Lord to forgive you. Just receive, just receive, just receive. Just receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just receive His empowerment. Just receive. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Sarah, if you can help me and just close us out this morning.